Hello, this is Mrs Pierce Dent from Malmesbury Science and Faraday, who's going to help me today with some Key Stage 3 demonstrations on particles. I'm going to take you through a series of different demonstrations that give us some clues or evidence for the way particles behave in solids, liquids and gases. If you want to watch a particular demonstration, just fast forward to the right time. After each demonstration, you can pause the video and have a think about what this tells us about the behaviour and arrangement of particles in the material. I'll then explain what the demonstrations tell us about particles so you can see if you're right. So in our first demonstration, I'm going to use this hoop and this ball. Now they're both made from a metal called brass, which is a mixture of copper and zinc. Now, at the moment, these are cold, they're just at room temperature. And if you look carefully, you can see that the ball passes easily through the hoop. Just like everything else, the metal that the ball and the hoop are made from are made of particles. And these particles are in the solid state, which means that the particles are really close together. But what happens to those particles if we heat it up? So I'm going to move my Bunsen burner over and I'm going to heat up the ball. I'm going to open the air hole up so I'm on a roaring blue flame and then I'm going to hold the metal ball in the flame above the blue triangle where it's hottest. Now as I heat it, energy is being given from the flame to those particles in the metal. But what effect is that going to have on them? So I've been heating it for nearly a minute and now watch what happens. I'm going to turn my flame back onto safety. Now watch what happens if I try and put it through the hoop. It doesn't fit. Whatever I do, I can't get the ball to go through the hoop. Now it doesn't look like it's changed, but obviously something has happened to make the ball larger. Now what I want you to do is pause the video and have a think. What's happened to the particles in the ball to stop it from going through the hoop? So let's think about what particles are like inside a solid. They're tightly packed together and they are vibrating within their fixed positions. I often think of it a bit like a box of eggs. Imagine a box where each egg has its own individual compartment that it can't move out of. But if you close the box and give it a little shake, the eggs can vibrate within those little compartments. And that's a bit like the particles in a solid. They're staying where they are in their fixed positions, but just vibrating backwards and forwards. So what happens when we heat up the ball? Well, the flame gives the particles energy, so they vibrate more. So the movement within their little compartments, within their fixed positions, is getting bigger and bigger. Now the particles themselves are not getting bigger. They are not expanding. And that's a mistake people often make. As they vibrate more, they just move slightly further away from each other as their vibrations get bigger. So as each particle vibrates more, it moves a little bit further away from all its neighbors. And that in turn makes the whole object expand. As the ball cools down though, obviously the particles lose the energy, the vibrations get smaller again, and the particles just move a little bit close together and the ball contracts. So just remember, the particles do not expand, but the vibrations get bigger and the particles move a little bit further apart so the ball expands. So in this demonstration, we're gonna compare a solid, a liquid, and a gas. And that's what I've got in these three syringes here. Here, in the middle one, I've got some sand and the end of the syringe has been sealed so it doesn't fall out. On this one here, I've just got some water in there and in this one, I've got some air. And just like the sand one, the end has been sealed so the air and the water also can't get out. So the sand and the water and the air, there's particles in all of them. But this quick demonstration is going to get us to think about how they are arranged. I start with a solid, and I'm going to put my finger on the end here just in case the seal breaks. I'm going to give the sand a really good squeeze. So with all my force, I'm going to push down on the plunger. And it doesn't move at all. However hard I try, I can't squash the sand. 
I can't get the particles in the sand any closer together than they are already. What about the water? So I press with all my might on the plunger and it doesn't move. I can't squash the water into a smaller space. But what about the gas? So I've just got ordinary air in here and again it's been sealed, you can see there, to stop the air from getting out. And this time when I press the plunger, it moves. And then it bounces back again. If I take the force off, it goes back to being at about, what's that, five, six, seven, eight, nine millilitres. But if I press it down, I can get it all the way down to five. I can almost half the volume of the gas. So what does that tell us about the particles? Pause the video and have a think. So what does this demonstration tell us about the particles in a solid, liquid and gas? Well, since I can't compress and squeeze the solid and liquid into a smaller volume, that gives us a clue that the particles in these two substances are very, very close together. And even when I put the force on them, I can't get them to go any closer. That's the same with a liquid. I can't squeeze it at all. And that's because the particles in the liquid are also really very close together. However, the gas is the different one here. Remember, when I squeeze this, I can almost half the volume. And that's because the particles in the gas are far apart from each other. And when I put the force on, I can squash the particles closer and closer. But it gets to a point where I can't squash it any further. And that's because I've already brought the particles very close together. And if I was super strong and kept squeezing and squeezing, I could even turn it into a liquid but I'm not that strong. So in this demonstration, we're going to see how particles in a liquid behave differently when they're hot and when they're cold. I'm gonna use these purple crystals, potassium permanganate, and I'm gonna put them into equal volumes, 300 mils of hot water and cold water. So these crystals will dissolve in the water, and as we watch them do that, it'll give us some clues as to how the particles are behaving differently in the hot water and the cold water. I'm just going to sprinkle a few of them into my cold water and a few of them into my hot water. What's happened to the purple crystals when they've gone into the water? Well, they've dissolved. The particles that were in the crystal are starting to move apart and mix with the water particles. That's what dissolving is. Now we're gonna leave that just a few minutes and come back to it. So the beakers have been left for a few minutes and already we can see quite a big difference. If we look in the cold water, we can see a lot of the purple is still concentrated at the bottom. Now the crystals have dissolved and the particles have moved away from each other, but they haven't mixed a lot with the water. But in the hot water beaker, you can see a lot more of the liquid is now purple. Somehow, the purple crystals have been moved through the water without me having to do anything to it. Why do you think that might be? So what this demonstration shows us is that particles in a hot liquid are moving more and faster than they are in a cold liquid. Now we can't see those particles move, but we have the evidence or the clue that they're moving faster because the purple color from the dissolved crystals has mixed much more quickly in the hot beaker than the cold beaker. In the tube I've got here is just plain water. Now this is a specially designed tube because it is this rectangular shape and it goes all the way round and is filled with water up to this point here. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by putting some of these purple crystals into the top of my tube and they're gonna move down here and settle at the bottom here in the water. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to light a candle. Now a little bit like the ball and hoop experiment, this is gonna provide some heat energy to the particles. Do you remember what happened to the particles in that experiment when they got hot? So the candle is going to start heating up the water particles in this corner of the tube. Now what we have to do is watch carefully to see what happens to the purple particles at the top. 
can you see the purple particles are starting to move? And they're starting to move in this direction. Can you see the purple now at the bottom of the tube here? And as it comes along, it's starting to fall down this side. They're not moving towards the candle, they're moving away from the candle. What's happening to the water particles when they're being heated by the candle? And why are the purple crystals moving in this direction away and then towards the candle at the bottom? Pause the video and have a think about what's happening. As the water is heated by the candle, the water particles are starting to move away from each other. The water is expanding, a little bit like the ball expanded in that ball and hoop experiment. But why does that make the purple move round the tube? Well, that's because as the water is expanding and the particles are getting that little bit further away from each other, they are starting to rise up this side of the tube. That's because the water becomes less dense. Now, density is a measure of how much a certain volume of a substance weighs. And as the particles move apart, that volume reduces in mass. So density decreases and the water rises and the purple crystals move with the water. As they reach this side, they start to move down and you end up with a little current a movement of the water particles around the tube. So this tells us lots about liquid particles. It means that they're free to move. They're not in fixed positions like they are in solids. And it means that as they get heated and they expand, they reduce in density. And this creates this convection current. So in this demonstration, we're going to look a little bit more at how hot liquids and cold liquids behave differently. What I've got in my two little bottles here is just plain old water, but I've coloured it with food colouring and the blue one here has been in the freezer, so this is really cold. The red one, I've used boiling water from the kettle to mix with the food colouring, so this one's really hot. And in my beaker in the middle, I've just got ordinary tap water at room temperature. And all I'm going to do is knock the two bottles over and watch what happens to the two liquids. If you look, you will see the red liquid starting to move upwards towards the top of the beaker. And over here on the blue side, you can see the blue liquid pouring out and moving down to the bottom of the beaker. Why are the two liquids behaving differently? They're both just water, but one's hot and one's cold. Why don't you have a think about it now? So the only difference between the red water and the blue water is the temperature. The red water moves upwards when it's tipped over. Because it's hot, the particles have got more energy. And as we saw with the ball and hoop, that means the particles move slightly further apart from each other. This reduces the overall density of the water, so it rises up through the water that's at room temperature. Cold water, the particles have got less energy, so they're moving more slowly and they're slightly more tightly packed together. This makes the blue water more dense and so it sinks down in the beaker and you can see the blue colouring at the bottom. You might also have noticed that the red colouring has spread out more in the beaker and again that's due to the particles having more energy and so being able to move faster. So for this demonstration I've got three solid materials this time. Now these three blocks are all the same size but they're made of different materials. We've got a metal, aluminium, we've got wood, and we've got a plastic called perspex. Now, would we expect the particles to be the same in each of these materials? The same size and the same mass? We know how they're arranged, but how are the particles different? Now, one way we can investigate the difference in these particles is by weighing them and measuring their mass in grams. So if I start with the metal, and pop it on my balance here, we can see it's measuring 109 grams. Now the wood is exactly the same size. You might think it's got the same number of particles. Maybe it's going to weigh the same amount. Let's test it. No, the wood has a lot less mass. 
it's only 16 grams. That's a very small amount compared to the um, mass of the aluminium that was over 100 grams. So although the block is the same size, it doesn't have the same mass. And finally, the plastic. The mass of the plastic is 46 grams, somewhere in the middle of the other two. So pause the video and have a think. What does this tell us about the particles? We've seen that although the materials are all the same size, they don't have the same mass. We could say that they have different densities. So this also tells us that the particles might be different sizes and different masses, but overall the size of the material is the same. So for this experiment, we're going to look at a solid again. And this time I've got a metal rod made from copper. And I'm going to investigate what happens to the heat energy when I just heat one end. Now we know already that the materials will expand as they get hotter because the particles gain energy and move away from each other. But what else happens to that energy? So this is my experiment. On my rod, I'm going to put some Vaseline or petroleum jelly onto one end. And this is kind of like a soft wax, which will melt when it gets hot. Now I'm gonna move that away from the Bunsen. There you are, Faraday, you can look after that. And then onto that, I'm going to stick a drawing pin and I'm going to balance my metal rod so that the end of it is in the Bunsen flame. So I'm gonna turn my Bunsen flame onto blue so it's the hottest it can be and I'm going to heat the end of the rod and we're gonna watch what happens at the other end. So did you see that? The drawing pin fell off the end and the reason why it did that is that the Vaseline melted. So how did this end of the rod get hot enough to melt the Vaseline and to drop the drawing pin? Pause the video and have a think. So what we've seen in this demonstration is that the heat energy can move through the material. Now we already know that solid particles can only vibrate in their fixed positions. And as they gain energy, they vibrate faster. So what's happening here? Well, as I heat this end of the rod and the vibrations get greater in the particles here, that energy is then transferred to more particles along the rod. As they vibrate faster here, they bump into the next particles and make them vibrate. And this moves the energy through the material without the particles having to move at all. And we call that conduction.